Thanks for joining us today with 100 Plus, a review of the most important people, events, and ideas of the last 2,000 years. Today, Mike Woodruff will be focused on Athanasius. He's a leading figure in the fight to protect the work that was done at the Council of Nicaea. He's the one celebrated in the statement, Athanasius Contra Mundum. Today we focus on the events following the Council of Nicaea, paying particular attention to um, the tireless work of Athanasius, who was born in the 290s in Alexandria, uh, who studied under, sort of was tutored by Alexander, the bishop of Alexandria that we spoke about last time. Uh, Athanasius is known to have attended the Council of Nicaea, uh, but he doesn't say anything. He's a, he's a young guy. But he makes up for it later because for really the rest of his life, the next 50 years, um, Athanasius is going to champion the work of Nicaea and not stop until all the issues that were being addressed there have been settled. So let me back up and get started. You'll remember the Council of Nicaea. This is what we looked at last time. It was called by Constantine to help unify his empire by helping to unify the church. This meant they had to address the problems of Arianism, which were named after Arius, this popular and dynamic preacher who claimed that Jesus was not equal to the Father. Um, Arius advocated a view that uh, sort of lives on today with the Jehovah's Witnesses, saying that Jesus was begotten, uh, he's not equal to the Father, there was a time when Jesus did not exist, um, he's, he's not fully God. So this caused uh, understandable havoc because, of course, Jesus claimed to be fully God. The New Testament teaches that he is God. Uh, the early church affirmed that he is God. And there's a sense in which um, he must be God to save us. So um, Constantine wants to put this down. He calls the, uh, about 320 bishops together to his summer palace in Nicaea, which is outside of Constantinople, now Istanbul, uh, this, is, this is going to be the first of the seven ecumenical councils. And while the bishops gather there, they're going to quickly vote down Arianism and then spend uh, a couple months trying to establish uh, what it is that they were affirming. And, and what, they, what they write is called the, the Creed of Nicaea. Well, not too long after the Council of Nicaea ends, there was a few other issues that they, they dealt with, um, not too long after it ends, Arius is going to be run off. We don't really hear from him much um, after that. Alexander, the bishop, who was the first one to have the dust up with Arius, he is going to die. And Athanasius is going to become the new bishop uh, of the area. So the bishop is the regional leader, the, the pastor to the pastors. But the challenge is there's a lot of sort of uh, undercurrent and dissent. Not many people are thrilled by the work that they did in Nicaea. Both sides have issues with it. Uh, they don't think they've got it exactly right. Some fear that in, uh, for instance, that in beating back Arianism, they've gone the other direction and they've fallen into modalism. Um, the idea that there's one God in one person and so, um, this is an issue. Now, as long as Constantine is alive, and he lives for about another 10 years, as long as he's alive, the council's convictions sort of officially stand. But Constantine restates the two bishops that voted against it. The vote, again, was 316 to 2. He restates the two bishops that voted against it. And, uh, and when he dies, he leaves his sons, uh, he's got three sons, uh, in the care of Eusebius, who's got some Arian influences. Remember, uh, Eusebius was at the Council of Nicaea. He was the official biographer of Constantine. He's a friend of Arius's. He voted for the council. He voted for the creed, but he, he doesn't love it. So, uh, and then after Constantine dies, he spends all this time arguing that he's got to unify the church, which we're glad for, by the way. Um, he's got to unify the church in order to unify his empire. Well, as soon as he dies, he divides his empire among his three sons. And, uh, and while they sort of shared their father's um, willingness to kill their enemies, uh, they don't always share their father's theological convictions. And the tension around the Arians and the semi-Arians uh, that was sort of under the surface when Constantine was alive, now it sort of bubbles up to the surface. One of Constantine's sons even becomes sort of a hyper-Arian. 
So you might remember I said that the, there was this debate over whether or not they should use the word homo oisian or homo usian, uh, whether Jesus is similar to God the Father, similar in essence, or whether he's exactly the same. Well, this guy says he's nothing at all. He gave a completely different track, and he says that there's no overlap uh, between them. He's unlike the Father. So... Um, it also means that um, various leaders and groups will all start to pick on Athanasius because Athanasius is going to stick with, really, effectively, the creed of Nicaea. And he's not going to back down. He will end up in exile five different times. Uh, he keeps coming back. He keeps, he's, again, he's sort of like the Energizer Bunny. You just cannot keep this guy down. Uh, he'll spend much of his adult life on the run, and he will spend the rest of his life trying to clean up this mess and clean up all the theological messes that people are sort of willing to compromise their way into. So we celebrate Athanasius in part because he eventually prevails. Um, it will take all his life, but he will, um, he will ensure that the Nicene Creed is embraced and Arianism in all its forms is chased away. He'll also do some other things. He'll write some important books, one called On the Incarnation, uh, is often cited, always one line out of it always gets mentioned, and that is that he was made man that we might be made gods. Um, another book that he wrote was called Life of Antony. Uh, it's about monasticism, and he's favorable. We're, we're going to see that it's basically it's a call to humility, a call to the kind of humility that we see in Jesus. So when Constantine becomes uh, a, a Christian, uh, remember, that opens up this sort of un... Um, it opens up a bit of a marriage between the church and the state, and there's a lot now, a lot more power for the church and a lot more money for the church. And there's a lot of people that just feel like the church gets corrupted. And so one of the early efforts to reform the churches are these people who will try and uh, walk away from all that is enticing and power and corruption. We'll look at that in one of the upcoming inflection points because there's a number of people that will lead these kind of movements, including Benedict. Um, but we'll look at that in the future. So here's some things to know about Athanasius and then this Council of Constantinople, um, which will be the second ecumenical council. So the first thing that I'd say, just as, as a takeaway for us, is we need to understand that some differences actually matter. Um, as Mark Twain said, sometimes the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Uh, there are distinctions that do matter. Now, I try really hard to not get sucked into debates that don't matter. Um, that's the whole idea behind the Fence Post series that I wrote, saying, look, there's, there's uh, the right belief isn't represented by a point. It's represented by a big, open, grassy area inside of these, and I said these six, fence posts. There are things that we have to fight over. The, the Trinity, the authority of, this, of the Bible, the, the, the deity of Jesus Christ, that we're saved by grace through faith. There are some things where you say, look, this is, these are just, these sort of define the Christian faith, and, and we can't waffle on these. So um, the deity of Jesus, which is, there's a sense in which the, the debates around Nicaea and Constantinople are, are about, about the Trinity, but they're, at one level, about uh, the, the deity of Jesus, and they're about how the gospel is going to work and unfold. These are things that we can't, uh, we just can't be soft on. And so Athanasius sets a great example. He, he's not willing to compromise on things that you can't compromise on. And he keeps it up when emperors threaten him and when he's kicked out and he's being chased around and the semi-Aryans are banishing him and he just keeps fighting. So there's, there's uh, uh, an example there for us. Um, the, the second thing that I would say is that um, what you need to understand is that in addition to some attacks around this time, uh, around the deity of Jesus, we have two other attacks that start to surface. One is around the deity of the Holy Spirit. So um, remember, there's just very little that's said about the Holy Spirit uh, in this because it wasn't a flashpoint back in Nicaea. But you now have some groups, um, sometimes uh, called the Macedonians, because they're led by a guy out of Constantinople called Macedonius, 
Uh, they're also called the, the, the pneumatomachians um, because I think some people just want the first year of seminary to have a lot of big, uh, hard to understand words like the, I don't know, first year of law school or first year of medical school. But there are people that were denying uh, the full deity of the Holy Spirit. This group doesn't get very far. Uh, they'll sort of be shown the door by the Cappadocian Fathers. This is Basil the Great, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of Nazianzus. These were good thinkers. Uh, they come alongside uh, Athanasius at the same time, and they're going to push back this attack on the Holy Spirit. And by the way, stay with me. I realize all these names, oh my goodness, and I, you know, modalism and Sabellianism and Pneumatomachians and the, the Cappadocian Fathers. At some point, uh, you stop introducing new names and new councils and all this stuff, and some of these things start to fall into place. So um, I want to keep sort of introducing these names so I can later on go, remember these guys? We talked about them here. So Stay with me. The puzzles will fall into place. A third thing to understand, or excuse me, another challenge that, that came around this time, in addition to the Holy Spirit being challenged, the big challenge was to the deity of Christ, then you got the Holy Spirit being challenged. We're going to have another challenge that rises up with this guy named Apollinarius, who's a friend of Athanasius. And Apollinarius, for a guy that sort of has some heretical views, he seems to be a good guy. He just gets in over his head. So he writes uh, about the Incarnation, and he just does a really bad job. So the Incarnation is the idea, Latin word carnos is flesh, so God becoming in the flesh, uh, one of us. And, and, and so having now established in one sense that Jesus is fully God, uh, what, what Apollinarius does is he says, you know, he's fully God and he just sort of blows out the human body. And it suggests that Jesus is not fully man. And this is not going to be an issue that's resolved at Constantinople, but it's going to come up at Constantinople, and it's going to be resolved later on when we get to the Chalcedonian definition. Um, so it comes up here. Apollinarius is going to get attacked from all sides. He's just outgunned. But some people are going to say, look, the, the Jesus of the Gospels is very human, and he's the, he's the new Adam. He's the second Adam. And... Um, and Gregory of Nazantius, one of these Cappadocian fathers, is, is going to make a famous line, and that is that what God does not adopt, he cannot redeem. And so God is going to um, not adopt Jesus in the sense that, um, that we get adopted. Jesus is always, right, he's, he is unbegotten with the Father or eternally begotten from the Father. So he's not adopted like we are, but uh, Gregory of Nazantius is going to argue for the full humanity of Jesus. So... Things will be straightened out when the Emperor Theodosius, a good guy on the eastern part of the Roman Empire, uh, he is going to come into power and he is going to be a defender of the Council of Nicaea. And uh, he's going to call a council in Constantinople. So now it's been built, it's years later, uh, and this is going to be the second of the seven great ecumenical councils. They convene in 381, and in short order, they say no to anything that is going in the direction of, um, of Arianism. Arianism is out. Semi-Arianism is out. Hyper-Arianism is out. The language of Nicaea is going to be uh, affirmed, and they're going to strengthen it a bit. They're going to modify the Nicene Creed. Excuse me. They're going to modify the Creed of Nicaea and give us the Nicene Creed which is also sometimes called the Nicene Constantinople Creed. And yes, I'm sorry about all that. Good grief. It's, it will be on the quiz, by the way. But you would think that they could do a better job than saying the Creed of Nicaea is different than the Nicene Creed, which is also sometimes called the Nicene Constantinople Creed. <laughs> You're like, okay, wow. Could you have made that any more difficult for us to keep straight? Um, so... Here's what I want to do. I, I, want to read, uh, I want to read part of this creed for you because you have heard uh, some of this. So the, the creed of Nicaea and Constantinople is longer than what generally gets read as the Nicene Creed. I want to read you the Nicene Creed. This is what you likely have heard in church. And it's going to sound in many ways like the Creed of Nicaea, but there are some differences. So, 
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who is with the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life in the world to come. Now, you'll notice that the, the whole idea of the Holy Spirit is more uh, developed in this, in this council or in this creed. And uh, it's still very heavy about Jesus, but uh, it also beats down all the Arian uh, options. Now, there are some other things that happen at the Council of Constantinople. One of them is that there is a claim. So it's in Constantinople, which is now claiming to be the new Rome. So it's the Constantinople is the Istanbul is the is the is the city that uh, Constantine built because he wanted to rule the entire Roman world, both east and west, uh, from the east. That was the that's where the money was. That's where the intellectuals were. That's where the enemies were coming and all of that. So uh, Constantinople is the new Rome, and so there is a push to say that the bishop of Constantinople. Uh, is sort of on part of the Bishop of Rome and above uh, all the other bishops. And this makes pretty much everybody mad. Uh, the other bishops are like, yeah, you can't diss us. And, the, and the, the Bishop of Rome says, yeah, and you're not going to, I'm not going to acknowledge that we're in the same league. So, um, look, there's already a movement back at this point for this idea that the Bishop of Rome is going to become first among equals. He's going to become later on elevated and and going to become uh, the Pope. Now, this is going to lead to the big split that's going to come, the great schism that's going to come in 1054. We'll look at that. Uh, But at the time that that split happens, they're going to fight over icons. That's sort of the principal thing that they disagree over. Uh, publicly, but what they're really fighting over is power, and the, it's the claim of the Bishop of Rome to be over everything, and the claim of the Bishop of Constantinople uh, to not recognize that and to be over the Eastern part of things. So, um, additionally, I, I mentioned this line here, um, and you um, probably didn't hear it, but I said, "We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Giver of Life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son." So this is called the Philoquy Clause, and it's going to become uh, contentious as well. So it's not, it doesn't appear to be in the first draft of the uh, Nicene-Constantinople Creed. It just says in the first draft, it says that uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, but it doesn't say it proceeds from the Son. And this is also going to be a point of contention later on uh, in in a a dust-up, between the east, which is going to say to the west, you've added this filiqui clause and the sun, and we don't recognize it. Uh, so we'll, again, that'll come back. But let's not lose our way. Um, the key point here is that Athanasius is going to get it done. And uh, he stood contramundum, Athanasius contramundum. When everybody else was, was going a different direction, Athanasius stands against the world, and uh, he prevails. If you need an example, during this COVID season, uh, of somebody who fights tirelessly, uh, who protects truth, who figures out what matters and is willing to uh, go to the the mat for it, then Athanasius is your guy. Athanasius Contramundum. Next time, we're going to look 
Athanasius will come up again when we go to our next uh, inflection point. We're going to look at how the New Testament canon comes together. The New Testament books are bound together and when that whole thing comes together. And Athanasius uh, writes a letter called the Easter letter. And it's, it's the first place where we see the list in the order, the exact list in the order that we're going to recognize today. So we'll look at how... Um, how the books of the New Testament come together to be recognized as having the uh, divine authority of God. That's next in Inflection Point 10. Be well.